This is the U.S. intelligence agency, Mind Control. At least 29... Alright, we're not in Turkey yet. Actually, fuck it, let's go to Turkey. People yeah. are dead after a fire. Yeah, it's got a, a 67 on the democracy in... index. Senegal. Mm hmm. That's really, that's Turkey. really high. The club, called the Masquerade, is it reportedly is. in the basement of a luxury high rise building, taking up two floors below ground level. The fire reportedly broke out in the middle of the day, and all of the victims are believed to be people involved with the renovation. The city's mayor told reports that there was no application filed for construction at the location. Whoa. He offered condolences for the lives lost and wished the injured a speedy recovery. Reports say three people were detained in connection with the fire, and there were warrants issued for two others, including the manager of the club. An investigation into the cause of the fire is ongoing. For Inside Edition Digital, I'm Mara. Thanks. Someone's going to go to Finland, but we'll, we'll stay on Turkey. Yeah, this chinchilla is going to town on something, like trying to dig through a box or something I got going over there. Hey, stupid! What are you? What are you digging into? Like he's he's just going ham, spazoiding. <laughs> yes, this is a great video on Turkey. I forgot to do the Instagram post. I just did it. Why are you no play? This video was brought to you by Ground News. The main opposition party, the CHP, beat Erdogan's AKP, winning nearly 40% of the popular vote and dominating in Turkey's big cities, most notably Ankara and Istanbul. So in this video, we're going to take a look at these results, why the CHP did so well, and whether this could spell the end for Erdogan. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. So let's start with a bit of context. The last time Turkey held local elections was way back in 2019. At these elections, Erdogan's AKP came out on top at the national level, winning 43% of the popular vote. The CHP then came second with 30% of the vote, and a new right-wing Turkish nationalist party called the Good Party came third with 8% of the vote. It's a anyway, good while party. the CHP didn't do that well at the national level, this was Which in part because they didn't perform the all that good well party. in rural areas. But they did do much better in Turkey's big cities. Most notably, the CHP's candidate Ekrem Emamoglu won the mayoral race in Istanbul, and the CHP candidate Mansur Yavas won the mayoral race in Ankara. Now, the CHP's success in Ankara and Istanbul didn't go down too well with Erdogan, Presumably because the man's how all of and is, would be the most there, is what? Uh purple. So on the map, Kurdistan was purple. All the their districts. Democrats. No, what it's is, just DEM. It's just a it's just a party. DEM. Visible politicians in Turkey, except for the president right. himself. So in a moment, basically the other that Ekrem Emamoglu won. They're basically talent of try they basically um overturning the elections in these councils and stuff. Mm. They're doing a lot of shady shit in these regions where which they want this party. Which one is Erdogan's party? Uh, uh, is it CHP or AKP? I'm not sure. Mm. Won the mayoral race in Istanbul, and the CHP candidate Mansur Yavaş ordered Istanbul's election to be rerun, only to be beaten again a month yeah. later by Imagine an even that. larger margin. At the time, there was a lot of commentary about how the opposition could build off this success in Ankara and Istanbul to challenge Erdogan for the presidency. Okay, so he he must be AKP. Erdogan is if AKP. They're the opposition. Yeah. If yeah. they're the if the CHP is opposition and yeah. AKP, they're must like be, something, must be Erdogan. something. I don't know. But them something. them winning in uh, the cities is kind of interesting. Istanbul, and then Erdogan tried to be like, do it, run it again, and still lost. Like, what mm. did you think was going to happen? See. Unfortunately, the opposition, though, at the presidential election last year, their candidate, Kemal Kalic Taroglu, was unable to beat Erdogan, losing by a 52 to 48 margin. Anyway, while the AKP so performed fun. worse than they have done in the past at the parliamentary elections, which were held at the same time, they were still able to form a majority with their coalition partner, the MHP. 
This was basically a win for Erdogan, who was gifted another five-year term as president with a functioning majority in parliament. Anyway, this is why there wasn't much optimism for the opposition going into last weekend's elections. But as the results started coming in on Sunday evening, it became clear that they massively outperformed expectations, winning 37.8% of the popular See, vote. The green the one right there. 35.5%. That like one, in 2019, the CHP performed especially yeah, well in yeah. Turkey's urban areas. That's but, the one that I see like okay. um, all the all the my Kurdish friends voting for and stuff. Because most mm. of the Kurdish people I know are going to be from the Turkish region, even though they don't live there now. Yeah. And then I think they also the, performed better than expected in Turkey's we have to check. Mm. rural areas, especially in the west. On top of this, Imamoglu and Yavas both won again in Istanbul and Ankara, this time with even larger majorities. And they both won majorities in the relevant councils, which means that they have way more power. This is the CHP's best result since 1977, and the first time that Erdogan's AKP have lost a national election since their establishment in 2001. So what explains the opposition's success here, especially considering how badly they fared in 2023? Well, as we see it, there are three big reasons. The first is the economy. Now, we've done a whole load of videos on this topic elsewhere, so if you want to go and watch those, then you can find out more. But the TLDR is that Turkey has been suffering through a long-running economic crisis, which was basically caused by Erdogan insisting that the Turkish central bank cut rather than raise interest rates in the face of rising inflation. As expected, this policy stoked inflation and weakened the lira, which went from 5 to the dollar in 2019 to about 20 in May of last year. However, a month after last year's presidential election, Erdogan quietly U-turned on this policy. He installed an orthodox finance minister and central bank governor, who promptly raised interest rates. Erdogan was clearly hoping that even if it meant a quick recession, rate hikes would be able to get the economy back on track before the local elections. But this hasn't happened. Despite raising Turkey's benchmark interest rate as high as 50%, the lira has continued to decline mm. against the dollar, and inflation is still running above 60% year on year, with the central bank warning that it could get as high as 80% this summer. All in all, raising interest rates was obviously a politically embarrassing U-turn for Erdogan, and so far it's failed to bring down inflation, with ordinary Turkish citizens now struggling with both rising prices and rising borrowing costs. The second reason is that in retrospect, it was clearly a mistake for the opposition to run as a coalition in 2023. While it made some sense in terms of electoral arithmetic, opposition coalitions who are united by their dislike of the incumbent rarely actually do well at the ballot box. This is largely because they're just too ideologically diverse, and this diversity usually leads to infighting and confused messaging. Something similar happened in Hungary in 2022, when incumbent Viktor Orban trounced an eight-party anti-Orban coalition, and it looks like it might be happening in India too, where a 26-party anti-Modi coalition has been beset by infighting. The third reason for their success, though, is candidates. In short, Kalicha Roglu was not a popular candidate for the presidential election, and polling at the time suggested as much, but Kalicha Roglu refused to let anyone else have the job, arguing that he was the only one who could manage such an ideologically diverse coalition. Even after losing the election, he refused to resign as the leader of the CHP, only to be ousted at the annual party congress in November. Kalicha Roglu was then replaced by deputy leader of the CHP's parliamentary group, Oskar Odsel, who was supported by Ima Moglu. Anyway, last weekend's results suggest that Odsel was more popular than his predecessor, and that the CHP can do better when the limelight is on Havas and Imamoglu. So what does this mean for Erdogan and Turkey going forwards? Well, it'll certainly put a spanner in Erdogan's proposed constitutional reforms. For context, after last year's presidential elections, Erdogan promised to introduce a new, quote, civilian and liberal constitution after the local elections. Now, nothing's been confirmed, but many commentators assumed that, like in 2017, it would allow Erdogan to run for office again in 2028. However, the AKP's poor showing means that Erdogan doesn't have the political momentum for a constitutional reform, which would require a three-fifths majority in parliament to be put forward to a referendum, and a two-thirds majority to be ratified directly. Another reason that Erdogan might be wary of doing this is that their re-election means that Imamoglu and Yavas now look like strong contenders for the presidency. <laughs> Polling suggests that both of them would have probably beaten Erdogan last term around, were it not for Kalicja Roglu's stubbornness, and their re-election suggests that their popularity is enduring. After another term in office, both Imamoglu and Yavas will have a bigger public profile by 2028, and be well-placed to capitalize on Erdogan's waning popularity. Anyway, when researching this election, we found that it was really important to balance the different opinions on this topic. And fortunately, we were able to easily compare opinions thanks to our sponsor, Ground News, a website and app developed by a former NASA engineer on a mission to give readers an easy, data-driven, objective way to read the news. And as such, every story... It says two things. Uh, um, can you take over for the Finland stuff? 
uh, hang on, I'm just reading. Okay, so the party that won is not the one that's more PKK related. It is mm. technically like a green left party, the Kurdish party that won those <laughs> regions. Okay. Interesting. Okay. The first, I, have, and I have a lot of tabs ones. open, so I need a second to like mm-hmm. get shit together. Yeah, that's fine. This this minute's five minutes long, so do what you need to do. Is that Erdogan and the AKP's dominance of Turkish politics is over? As you well know, that people used to call him Teflon Erdogan, right? Nothing bad stuck to him ever, including very bad economic uh, circumstances. But going forward, Erdogan and the AKP will have to fight tooth and nail for every vote. They're down to uh, 35% now, which is roughly where they started when they first founded the party in 2001. The second point that I'd like to highlight is that despite more than a decade of political polarization, values, social issues, etc., at the end of the day, people are still voting with their pockets. And this was Turkey's version of it's the economy stupid. What does he do <laughs> with his new central bank team, with his, uh, I call it Chancellor of the Exchequer? I mean, what does he do to stop Paul? What did you say, 80% inflation, something like yep. that? What does he do, Emre, to turn the ship around other than a lira devaluation? I think it sticks to the game plan in the short term, right? Treasury and Finance Minister Mehmet Shimshek has been administrating... Isn't uh, economics so interesting? In ...slow, uh, but increasingly harsher doses since June of last year, uh, when he came back to government, took over the reins as economies are. Uh, the central Will bank, you uh, uh, go away? Without the Mehmet Shimshek. Uh, we don't anticipate that to change, especially in the short uh, term. Erdogan's comments last night also said... Teach everyone about... The, uh, uh, you know, unknown but important people in the Middle East who have enormous political power. Because the, there's probably not... Yes, um, he's wedded. Mm-hmm. Like, the Finland thing is probably only, like, three to five minutes, and you want me to talk about guns while you walk away? Okay, do something else. Pick something else. No, 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 the no I, did. I did. Gaza convoy. No, 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 I got something else. Okay. To this economic policy rebalancing normalization effort, but he will want to see results. So I have a five if Erdogan had done video. better That's yesterday, Shimshek would have a much greater maneuvering room. Uh, but Chinchilla is still out uh, too. Erdogan will want to see results uh, from summer onwards once we've hit peak inflation and it's rated around 75% in one. May. Uh, if Shimshek doesn't deliver, then I think uh, we're in a bit of a tight spot uh, from uh, fall onwards. Um, and in terms of what he will do, we anticipate him to continue quashing consumer demand. So it's very bad for the households and then selective lending to export-oriented businesses. But a lot of SMEs are going to be hurting from this. So, Emre, just give us a little history lesson here. How do we get to this point with the Turkish economy? Um, let's see. 2011, Erdogan secures re-election as prime minister, calls it my master period, and starts banging on about the interest rate lobby and says high rates cause high inflation, I want low rates. A succession of central bank governors uh, play with magical realism, create these interest rate corridors, do backdoor tightening while loosening at the front. The banking authority undermines what they're doing. Fiscal and monetary Exit policy don't speak to each other. And in the end, Adam puts all the burden on very loose credit to keep mm. consumer demand mm. going. You have that, uh, especially on the back of the global financial crisis and the period that followed with all the quantitative easing, extra loose right. monetary policies, negative real rates. I agree. He got away with it for years and years and years <laughs> until he couldn't. Economics uh, is really overrated. Under the first executive presidency term starting in 2018, when he got rid of all the uh, uh, makers right. in his cabinet, appointed his son-in-law to run the economy, who proceeded to sell more than $125 billion mm. in reserves. My brother, this is Haram. Well, someone like you, and that would be Sonar Kagapte, in his wonderful book, Erdogan's Empire, was my book of the summer. Not the best like, source. Yeah. And his new <laughs> book is A Sultan What's in wrong? Autumn. Is Erdogan in his... Economics is shit. <laughs> Oh, pain. Okay. Awful. Fuck you, Bloom. <laughs> okay, it's six. I got a six minute video. That's how much time you have. Can't guarantee it. Okay, we're going to learn about one of the most important politicians in the Middle East. Are you two already fighting for real? I can't have a moment of fucking peace. Hey! Stop. Knock it off. Go to your perch. Ridiculous, these two.
one of Iraq's most influential social, political, and military figures. The cleric rose to prominence in the aftermath of the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003, when he led a popular militia against U.S.-led forces. Since then, he has played a number of roles in the war-ravaged country, from scholar to opposition leader, from self-styled reformist A guy. Watch. A guy. What the fuck? Why did it work like this? Middle East I doesn't claim, right? I'll be so mad if they claim this informative video, video about Mukhtar al-Sadr. Why did it go away? Leader. From self-styled reformist to political kingmaker. So who is Mukhtar al-Sadr? The chinchillas can't survive outside of here. It's too wet. And the only thing keeping them alive is them being separated from each other right now. <laughs> Biden is providing Jed Savishi despite his war crimes. True. <laughs> إلى تأسيس أكبر مقومات الدولة وهو تأسيس جيش إسلامي مطيع لمراجعه وقواته وإن شاء الله يكون هذا الجيش تحت اسم جيش الإمام المهدي Jail them. Look, jail them. Jail them. They're, they are running. They're running around. They could they could extend their run around time too if they just didn't kill each other you know you have to keep violent individuals uh, apart from each other he was born in 1974 to a prominent exactly two family. jail solutions His father the grand ayatollah muhammad sadr the sadr and father-in-law grand ayatollah muhammad bakr sadr formed the sadrist movement a religious shia movement that focused on helping iraq's poor communities both figures and were boy, have they this is this is an important thing, um, especially when you get into Iraqi politics. There's some narratives. Um, so the fact is, um, he's a whack job. Um, you know, he's like a chaotic evil in a way. But when the Battle of Fallujah was going on, he was providing assistance to the IAI. He specifically um, tried to stay out of it and uh, not escalate the civil war between the Sunnis and the Shia. But besides that, literal crimes that were committed by the IRGC backed Shia are still attributed to him. Things like drill torture, where they would execute people by using a drill in their head. Right, so they would they they would talk about solder doing drills and stuff, even though that wasn't the case. Um, he was very effective at killing Americans, though. So um, he also because uh, because America is stupid and played into Al Qaeda's hands, effectively the Shia run the country. Drill, not beheadings. He's never he he's he's there's only one. Uh, like political assassination he's implicated in and the evidence isn't strong uh, that said maybe his forces have committed crimes but not like the pmf has you know like the fucking the one guy a rocky rambo like the things that he's done to people is horrific but the beheadings was really uh um zarqawi things zarqawi really made that popular he could literally um he could cut somebody's head off in us in a single second. It took him that like he was a definitely had been dismembering bodies for criminal organizations for a long time before he started doing beheading videos and stuff. But um, because the Shia effectively rule the parliament, um, Sadr is like the only legitimate parliamentary figure for Iraqi interests at this point, because the other Shia party that's behind Noor Maliki, who was the president of Iraq. That's who's when George Bush gets the shoes thrown at him, Maliki's next to him. Uh, Maliki is also responsible for ISIS because the moment 
um, America leaves, he parks tanks outside the Sunni government. And the Sunni, the Sunnis were basically the vice president in this situation. And he exiled them all from government, just like the debathification, which was one of the biggest mistakes of the Iraq war. And so ISIS became a legitimate force for the Sunni in many cases, because the propaganda was played up that they were resisting the Shia. They also were playing off the civil war that had just gone on and just ended. So at the end of the day, um, is, is, uh, Sadr a good politician? No, he can't make up his mind whether to do this or that. He's very indecisive. He's, he's kind of, he's got like bipolar diplomacy and because he's a cleric, he doesn't actually run anything. It's candidates that his party backs basically that go into parliament. But because of this, he is an essential figure in keeping Iranian grip completely from taking Iraq. He's the only thing that basically stands in the way electorally from uh, the Iranians taking the country. Um, that said, there's other obvious things that are going on in Iraq that um, have a power imbalance outside of the uh, body of politics. Under the Ba'ath regime, but that didn't stop the spread of popularity for the Sadrist movement. Which attracted devoted followers through its social. Yeah, and that's another programs. thing too. Like he's he the lifting up the poor. That is a very documented thing. The, the the city that he's in, it used to be called Saddam City. Saddam renamed it that, but then after the invasion, it, they rename it Sadr City. And this is actually where the final battle between Americans and insurgents take place in the Iraq War. Is is in this city during the collapse of Iraq's economy under the weight of international sanctions in the 1980s and 90s. When his father was assassinated while leaving a mosque in 1999, Muqtada inherited the reins of the Sadrist movement. Four years later, when a US invasion toppled the Ba'ath Party, he saw US occupation as the new threat to Iraq and called on his followers to take up arms and rebel. They formed the Mahdi army and the- One of the funniest things about the Sadrist forces is that the U.S. to uh, early on to have strategies on, and he was he's also one of the first militias that comes up and starts resisting the Americans as well. Um, before some of the Sunni militias are formed, there's like um, I think the 1920 brigades. Um, I think they were very quickly to form. They might have been one of the first ones, but and also um, Al Qaeda in Iraq was already there, but they were in uh, Kurdistan and uh, like Mosul in the north. Um, and weren't really uh, that much of a thing yet. But they would do gun buyback programs. They thought it would be a good idea to get guns off the street so that way an insurgency wouldn't get worse. So they would like um, they would bring the Americans basically their broken guns that were like old and poorly maintained and the Americans would pay them for those guns and then they'd just go buy new ones because the guns are like so cheap which is just one of the funniest parts of like the US like mishandling of the situation to me. Militia that began staging attacks on coalition forces. On the 5th of August, 2004, the US administrator of Iraq declared al-Sadr an outlaw. And in response, Sadr called for a religious uprising against US forces. His militias concentrated their attacks on US troops in Najaf, a holy city for Shia Muslims. For three weeks, the Mahdi army engaged in fierce street fighting in the city. And summit. this is a classic thing right here. This type of tactic, this is a classic thing that really defined the early insurgency is you have this one guy who comes around the corner with his machine gun and then he's got a belt carrier that's running with him. Uh, you'll see a lot of this. You'll see these guys basically run out in the middle of the street and start opening fire on Americans and just get taken out. But like this guy's like a polo shirt, you know? fighting in the city's suburbs. A ceasefire was eventually negotiated, with the bulk of the Mahdi army fighters surrendering their weapons to US forces in exchange for amnesty from detention. But the Southern family didn't fight only the US. They've been widely accused of mass kidnappings and the murder of thousands of civilians during Iraq's ensuing sectarian civil war. In 2007... And that's, that's the part, like murdering civilians definitely happened. Definitely happened. I mean, it's like, you don't, it's, these are militias, right? It's, it's how much do you want to put that on the leader of those militias for each of them? Like, I, I think people like Zarqawi are a little bit more guilty of inciting the situation than 
some of the more legitimate military factions. Like I, I see this more comparable to like Azov Battalion. Even though obviously uh Azov Battalion isn't like slaughtering civilians like uh anyone in Iraq was. And the army took the port city of Basra after it lay siege to British army bases in the city and held it for more Were there taxes just trials and error? Did they have manuals? They developed over time. Um the what this the 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 stuff you'll really see from them in the in the Shia cities, it's um very early on is where you'll see that type of stuff that you just saw. But like um by the end of 2004, the insurgency had been completely advanced to a whole new thing. And um, you'll still see, so whenever there's political instability in Iraq and there'll be um, gunfights between militias in the capital and stuff like that, it'll be between these two Shia forces, the ones that are Iranian-backed and the ones that are actually from the proletariat of the Shia community. Yeah, and that's and the, so they did they did they really did were able to develop over time. Also, um Sadr City was in mortar range of the green zone. So this was a this was a huge struggle for the United States is the green zone constantly being mortared from this region. And they still have um like they'll use the rocket trucks a lot. You'll see so like uh the last big uh stir up, it was over elections. Um because basically he won parliament um, and uh, the they basically um, weren't going to let him have the seats and were fucking around with him and jerking around and stuff like that. Everything turned out fine in the end, but. More than six months, eventually forcing British troops. The to big withdraw. issue is that the, the next this is Maliki right here. Um, the big issue is that the opposition Shia who are backed by Iran, they have. Um, the southern oil field which is like one of iraq's main oil fields so they have a lot more economy backing them and a lot more money backing them here nuri al maliki then prime minister and southern rival ordered the iraqi Comic army Sans to retake basra him. from the mahdi army after the city fell southern fled to iran abandoning political life for a few years until he returned in 2011 to ally with maliki's second government and when they, the Battle of Sadr City, the way they did it is, um, I, Task and Purpose is a great video on this, but they basically bring out concrete barriers, six, six foot high barriers, and just cut the city in half with a wall. And that wall on the other side, it's out of range of the green zone. So it accomplished their goals of taking pressure off the green zone um, because that type of pressure was able to leverage um, negotiations in a lot of ceasefires and stuff. Um, with that's more in the interest of Sadr than it was in the coalition forces. So extremely effective um, throughout the entire Iraq war against the American occupation. Dispute would break out between the two again, and Sadr withdrew his support from government. With then this is what Sadr does, a hot, step, cold thing, Sadr attempted very to indecisive. His image and portray himself as a non-sectarian figure, forming links with Sunni leaders. In 2014, he rebranded the Mahdi army, renaming it the Peace Companies. It then joined several other Shia militias as part of the Hajj al-Shabi. That's or the, the popular PMF. Mobilization the Shabi forces. militias, you'll hear a lot of people say Shabi militias. That's the PMF. They suck. A paramilitary force formed in response to the upsurge of Islamic State in Iraq. While Hajj was essential in assisting the Iraqi forces in retaking cities from IS, human rights groups accused the paramilitaries mm -hmm. of torture and Wait. this and this also comes back to associating Sadr with the PMF, but his peace companies, the only thing they really were interested in doing is basically protecting um, places of worship because the, the first civil war is sparked by Zarqawi ka, ka, car bombing, a grand Shia mosque. That really what sparks the civil war. So Sadr establishes the peace companies and says that the main goal is to protect these holy sites. They basically, yes, they are Iranian-backed Shia militias, but um, even uh, a PKK faction is in the PMF. Um, the um, Yazidi faction the, of the PKK that's in uh, Sinjar, the Sinjar resistance uh, peoples there in the PMF as well. Um, and so there is some Sunni in there. It's just uh, 
generally backed and created by the former president of Iraq, Maliki, uh, basically is the father of the idea. But the leader of the PMF was killed with Qasem Soleimani in that, in that drone strike. And the extrajudicial killing of civilians in Sunni areas. Sadr would again withdraw his support from the government in 2016. He accused Prime Minister Haider al-Abadi's government of corruption and of failing to deliver on reforms. In 2016, he led a million-strong demonstration in Baghdad's Tahrir Square. This, uh, some of my follow- favorite pictures of protests come out of this. It'll take me a minute to find it, but um, the Iraqi government killed a lot of people uh, during these protests. And then um, basically Donald Trump kills Qasem Soleimani and it unites both sides of the Shia government in, in these protests. Like everyone was protesting something, but not necessarily the same thing. Wars began a pitch sit-in outside the green zone. In 2018, Sadr created the Sa'irun, or Moving Forward Alliance, a coalition of his newly formed Istiqlama Party and the Iraqi Communist Party, as well as smaller parties and civil groups. This is what I'm talking about. Like, 154... When this is why I think communists are cringe. They're backing they're backing the people that the literal Communist Party of Iraq is is you know because they're they're a pro Iran essentially because they're all Assadists and shit. Like, fuck Hezbollah. Hezbollah's fucking cringe. Like, this guy is so much cooler than Hezbollah. And he's more effective. No offense, but it sounds like some some fucking commie gobbledygook. The outbreak of the 2019 mass protest movement across Baghdad and the southern regions, Sadr once again withdrew his conference from the government and called on his bloc to boycott parliament and urged the government to resign. After months of protests, Prime Minister Adil Abdul Mahdi if was. If you subscribe to our Patreon, maybe we could come as well. Announced for 2021, uh, yeah. along with a number of election reforms. So they're now promises I would to crack down to on him. corruption. I, it, like, uh, he's up there with somebody that I would really like to meet and conduct an actual interview with because I don't yeah, think. That, that would be an in person interview. I don't think anyone really in the West, they're going to talk to him and like do the generic questioning and things like that. Yeah, they're not going to ask the right questions or the, yeah. they're not going to phrase the questions correctly to get the answers that you should be getting from him. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because... I don't, I don't think he's that unreasonable. Like, from all the stuff that we've looked at, I don't think he's that unreasonable of a person. For a minute, I he was like... I don't think he wants villain. to lead. Well, he... That's the thing, is he does lead. He does lead, but he it's, it's how the Taliban should be doing it. How I say that it's like, you don't elect don't fucking put sanctioned people in power like just rule mm-hmm. from the shadows and that's basically what he does yeah he, he's the the people's leader he's, he's almost like being thrust into that position and therefore mm-hmm. taken it. He, and i think this is i think this is uh more legitimate than a lot of communist rule where they take the direct reins i think like the vanguard mm-hmm. shouldn't be somebody who actually has like political power to wage it should just be like a guiding hand. Mm. And to form a government free from... Also, power. I really like... I, the, the, it might People might hate this, the indecisiveness about him and his cold feet, the in and out and stuff. But I really like how shaky he is on stuff where he's like, you you cross him and he's out. He, the coalition is done. You know, like he'll work with you <laughs> as long as you're not going to be a dick. Or an influence. Over the years, the cleric oh, has managed the, many ambiguous. This is the one Kurdish leader. This is the non-Iranian backed Kurdish leader. Um, the but he's also this guy is also no good. But uh, this guy is the reason why Kurdistan is divided, as well, because uh, it's all it's it's basically two warlord families in Iraqi Kurdistan. Is that Bazani or is it the other guy? Yeah. Yeah, so him and Barzani actually do a lot of coalitioning in the parliament. Their two parties okay. will do a lot of coalitioning. Mm. U.S. relationships. While a student of the Shia clergy in Iran... He was also the first, like, Shia, like, elite, like, top Shia cleric to go to Saudi Arabia in, like, years. Because he's he has uh, friendly relations with MBS as well. Because he hates Iran. Because they're taking over his country. He is open in calling for an end to Iranian influence over Iraq. He is a vocal critic of corruption and political ineptitude in government, 
with whom he has partnered. And while he has never completely distanced himself from Shia militias, Sadr calls for state regulation on them and limits on the arms they possess. This is one thing I think I told Jack is that Sadr's pro gun control. Um, when we were writing the article, but with his political influence growing, how will Sadr strike a balance between the many actors he's previously teamed up with, and how will Iraq fare with the cleric at its helm? I think he's like very comparable to Jelani in Idlib. It's like uh, not necessarily the ideal thing, but definitely I think is the best option. He seems like someone who doesn't entirely know what he is doing. Yeah. Yeah. Basically he like he he he's he's very unpredictable. He's he's a straight wild card. And mm -hmm. uh I think he kind of just like follows his gut and, and his gut is a very indecisive one. Where do you see Iraq in five to ten years? I don't think it falls apart again. But for Iraq to really prosper, Kurdistan must gain more independence from them, and Iran must be pushed out. Um, if if Iran isn't pushed out, it's still it's essentially a proxy state for Iran now. And that needs to change. Um, the people associated with Hezbollah, PMF, all that stuff needs to change. Now, if that happens through military force, that might be the case, but if it doesn't descend back into when we have international fighters coming in, because that's the issue is like, you'll hear this with a lot of Syrians as well. They'll say like the people in ISIS aren't from here. They, they, they aren't welcome. Like they're not really even considered Iraqis. It's sad even because like the uh, orphans of ISIS are exiled from the communities. Like the mm -hmm. kids, like their kids who survive or yeah. their parents are dead and they uh, were members of ISIS. It's really sad. Mm -hmm. That is. I'll just create more radicalization. That's, uh, yeah, uh, I think that's it's it's the the issue is like I said, Iran having control of that southern oil field, and also the issue in Kirkuk, in Kurdistan. Um, that I did we did a special on. Um, they have a big oil field, there, and it would mean that Iran controls the two largest oil fields in Iraq and having that kind of monetary and infrastructure power, um, especially considering they're exporting this oil to China and it's cutting in with the Iran's deal to China. They're also, they're like even siphoning water. If you go to listen to our very first episodes, they talk about how Iran is even stealing the fucking water from Kurdistan. Iran just sucks. Um, that's the, what I want to see is I want to see a, a Ukraine win the war and then all the militias who went to fight there to help out end up um, going and uh, liberating Iran. Um, hmm. Because I know that Ukraine isn't cowardly enough to hold people back from uh, regime change. That needs to happen. And it does need to happen. It's an interesting thought. <clears throat> That's, uh, yeah interesting. so instead instead of them partnering with saudi Burzani partners with turkey and turkey is also more friendly with the uh government in iraq so it ties them also into iran in that side as well but the other side the southern side of kurdistan is their iran the like it's they it's just bullshit it's all bullshit that's why both those parties are um kind of being phased out for this third party that's kind of rising up. Hmm. Cool. Is this more economy? In Finland killed one classmate Finland. and wounded two others in a shooting at the school this morning. A young person there, the 12-year-old, has been arrested now. And armed police responded to the school just outside the capital. A 12-year-old. After getting reports of a shooting just after 9 a.m. their time. Police say the people who were shot, their classmates, also 12 years old. The country's prime minister expressed shock over that shooting 
Finland it's witnessed wild. two previous deadly school shootings in 2007 and 2008. This morning, <laughs> Wake County bus drivers will compete in a school. This was just recommended to me. It was. What, what'd you do? Oh. This was just yeah, recommended I guess, to me. I guess it ended. Oh, make a mark for all that uh, education and Mukdal Sadr. I have. I have. Just checking. This is this. I just got recommended a turkey video because we, uh, even though we just finished it. Okay. No, that's fine. Well, I'll mark it and mark it again. Yeah, just it. Just leave a note that I have to cut this end piece back onto the. I'll ju I'll cut the Barzani and Turkey stuff together, and then you can pull out the Barzani thing out of it. Or sorry, the the. Yeah, um, yeah. Just I'll as long as there's thing. a note there. When you yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll I'll put it in the title. I'll say, uh, yeah. Turkey, Sada. Oh, here's a like here's a Hassan video on it too, but it's thirty minutes. Nope. nope. <laughs> I do not care what he has to say. Start this out in Turkey and some historic results for the opposition in local elections there. The party of President Erdogan has suffered its largest ever defeat in municipal elections. Correspondents say voters appear to be punishing his AK party for the sparring cost of living. The main opposition, CHP, achieved its largest victory in 45 years. It secured Whoa. wins in six of Turkey's eight largest urban centres, including the country. Oh, YouTube loading. His biggest city, Istanbul. And for the first time in 25 years, they won more municipalities than the ruling AK party. President Erdogan described his party's worst ever defeat as not an end, end. but a turning point. We will not disrespect our nation's decision in any way. Man, he looks and like shit, huh? It anyway. Is it just me, or does he look much mm. more like shit recently? Like, we will avoid being stubborn, acting against the national will, and questioning the judgment of our nation, as we have done so far. We will take the necessary <clears throat> steps by analyzing the messages. He's also older shit. He's 70. He's like a decade younger than Biden. ...given by the nation at the ballot box, most accurately and objectively, within the reason and in our inner conscience. Opposition supporters say, although these are local elections, victories in big cities are a significant show of force against President Erdogan's ruling party. This was the scene in Istanbul where thousands took to the streets to celebrate the opposition party's win. The city's incumbent Good. mayor, Ekrem Imam Alu, mm -hmm. declared victory after securing over 50% of the vote, well ahead of his nearest rival. He became oh, Istanbul's damn. first opposition mayor in 2019. He's now seen as the best place opposition candidate ahead of turkey's next presidential vote if he's gonna get arrested is <laughs> this mother this guy's this guy's on Here. ice okay I, it's over i just him. found he's, this he's gonna be accused thing. of corruption okay, make it more confusing on the edit later what is it it's just a two-minute thing on iraq and the arab state relations and how nope. they're investing on something nope and yoinked how honest are turkish elections i i think that the the what main issue with turkey's government? elections aren't the literal vote counting it's that erdogan will politically bully and mm -hmm. influence the elections beforehand like the actual mm -hmm. vote and counting after. i believe is relatively above board it's it's that he uses his power to like break the election beforehand basically in kurdish areas they're literally just rigged okay yeah well maybe for the kurds in 2028 he told supporters the result signaled a very important message to the world in this world, unfortunately, democracies were weakening. While well, these democracies were weakening, authority. A lot of Turkish people permanently living in Germany vote for Erdogan. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, well, diasporas are almost always Hitler. It's like that well, with Cuba. The, the, I've uh, talked like about this like uh, before, right? The the gray mm. wolves, the the nationalists living outside of Turkey, they're helping expand Turkey's power. Right. They want so to it's expand more Turkey's power. They're still. Okay. They're still supremacists. They're still nationalists, mm -hmm. right? And they see yeah, this okay. neo-Ottoman ideology as what they're exporting. Hmm. They essentially uh, are in Turkey, wherever they go. Hmm. There was a bunch of like Iranian expats who like worship the Shah over in America. Yeah, the diasporas are always Hitler. That's well, why. That's why when you on. go online, no, 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 you see a... that's different. That's way different. Mm. Because those people normally are like that because of like 
actual things that happen to them, right? Like families being killed, those types of things often, often come from like communist background and things like that. But also just, um, there is like a diasporoid type thing with the anti, uh, like Iranians have the Iranian diaspora to have a bad rap with the Middle Eastern community because they already hate them because they come from like a different Persian Shia background. It's just more uh, labeling and racism and stereotypes. A bunch of people who are like, you know, glory to Turkey, glory to Turkey. Oh, they're the one kill all you degenerates and then wolf posting. And then it's like, they live in London, you know? There are so many people like that. Seriously, you're on Twitter and you see, yeah, anytime you see some like crazy right wing, they could be like an Islamist. Mainly they could be like, like a Germany, Brussels like, 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 region and stuff. Not so much London. That's more Pakistan. Uh, Hungary or Russia or whatever. London, UK. What is it with London, dude? What is it that what is it about London that attracts so much crazy diaspora nonsense? Okay, if you like those countries so much, go and live in them. If you like Serbia so much, go and live there. Oh, you don't want to because it's a shithole? Too bad. Go. Terrorist regimes came to power. Many articles Afuera. around the world asked if we were coming at the end of democratic regimes. Thirty first of March, two thousand twenty four, is the day when democratic erosion in Turkey ended and democracy is rising again. Bolana Erin from the BBC's Turkish service says this is an unprecedented win too. for the opposition. People were expecting opposition to win in the largest cities of Turkey, but actually getting more votes than the government party in general in Turkey and uh, winning in some cities which they haven't won in. Hey. Nothing against this guy's appearance or anything, but he's scary. He's scaring me. Your eyes are so open. You, you look so unkempt. Are you going to eat me? <laughs> you're, you're like, yeah. Racist in the uh, last 40, 50 years is a very big success for the main opposition party, CHP. Chian Tugel is professor of sociology at the University professor, of California, Berkeley. He gave us his assessment of Turkish politics following on from these election results. Morning was, oh, I thought they were saying the other guy. Okay, Eric. Uh, mired with irregularities in Kurdish cities. And despite that, uh, the Kurds uh, took back most of their municipalities nice. uh, from the appointees that had been imposed by Erdogan undemocratically. Jesus Christ. I guess this I guess this fits, right? Yeah, anyone in the Middle East or the Arab North Africa, any like anything in that ballpark, you know, uh, cuz they know, you know. It, it's like, you know, how Hitler are you and how what kind of Hitler are you relative to the kind of Hitler that Erdogan is? And the reason France is different of course is because they have so many like of the Islamist Hitler varieties, but in this case their Hitlerism is countering the Hitlerism of Erdogan, whatever. Good lord. Good Lord. Now, Erdogan might try to do this again, actually. So the game is not over there. Uh, the the scuffle, scuffles were, will continue. And uh... Sweden? Okay, think of it this way. A lot of the people in those countries have been... Never mind, it's too complicated. The, the other dimension uh, is the, the growth of the far right. So th this has not stopped. So uh, th th that Erdogan has lost doesn't mean his vision. In 2015, when the now banned Kurdish HDP party won in every Kurdish area, all their mayors were just arrested and replaced with Erdogan party mayors. It's insane how bad it is there. Are you ready for this sweeping Kurdish victory to incite Rojava to start pushing back on the northern front of Syria? It's time. Rojava, the conquest lays before you. You will march north. And you will liberate your Kurdish brothers and sisters. Bro, it's time. they're about to be invaded. Total Kurdish victory. They're prepping for an yeah, invasion. Just, yeah. Let's go. Got to turn southern Turkey into northern Rojava. That's one of the reasons so why the international community physical. also won't help them with the fucking camps, right? Is So mm. if they have to keep those camps under control, it prevents them from exporting forces elsewhere and putting pressure elsewhere. Yeah. Also, they just foiled a escape attempt. There was a fucking another plot where they uh, really were about to like bust a, a bunch of Islamists out that they foiled. Damn. Votes have gone to a far right Islamist party, uh, which had been criticizing Erdogan because of his free market policies, his socially unjust policies that target poor people and uh, small shopkeepers and small tradespeople, and also his dealings with Israel. Uh, Turkey has serious trade with, with Israel, and Islamists are pretty unhappy about this. Uh, so actually, all of that is good. I, I, to be honest with you, I don't even understand why Erdogan supporters like Erdogan. Like, let me clarify. I understand why Erdogan supporters would like him more than other people on offer, but I don't know what Erdogan supporters would like Erdogan for, like, on his own, like, liking him, you know? <clears throat> because it seems like he... 
fucked up in so many of the ways. Like, I know the weird nationalist bit, but he doesn't even really do a good job with that. I don't know. He's not particularly charismatic. Mm. He's not much of a strong man. The economy is wretched under him. He has, like, a tenuous, like, you know, handful of alliances that kind of contradict it, each other. He's tall? Oh, must be that. Well, well, I mean... All I mean, he makes a pretty good point. Like, Erdogan is kind of shit. Like, how has he been in power for so long? Is it just the corruption, or is it... Yeah. Like, he it's... cheated. He cheated. Yeah. He cheats. That's I why that's he wins. Yeah. I figured that's what it was. He sucks. All of those could He's be really basic for a strong... Yeah. <laughs> ...strong democratic opposition, but the catch in all of this is that th this party I'm talking about, this far-right Islamist party, is also very anti-woman and anti-LGBT. So it's taking these democratic uh, demands. Anyway, I'm not and sure. It's, um, yeah, there's no um, Turkish influence uh, in America whatsoever. Um, besides food, a lot of uh, mm. Turkish chefs uh, like will come over here to um, train in our restaurants before going back to like a European country or something. Because hmm. like, we uh, are uh, high end stuff, mm. like chef chef places. Yeah. Well, the big the, the bigger risk is. Uh, th this party was already in a coalition with the, the governing party, uh, AK party, with Erdogan's party, and they, they broke off because of Israel and uh, Erdogan's free market policies. Oh, yeah. But if Erdogan makes some concessions, this party might, uh, you know, uh, recombine its forces. You really don't want Islamic rule in Turkey? I disagree, okay? It's time to reestablish the Ottoman Empire. It's time. Turkey is bloated and weak. We, we, we need to return to our roots, okay? No, you mean the Byzantine Empire? Eh, we could go farther back. Actually, Islamists tend not to like the Ottoman Empire. Well, yeah, the Ottoman Empire wasn't as Hitlerite as many, like, Islamists are today. The grand unified scale of Hitlerism as, like, the only determiner politically of what you believe in. No empire can ever be as radical as its adherents want it to be because... He's just talking shit. I'm, I, I'm like, I, I don't even know where to start or stop with that one. I don't know. I, I'm, I just mocked it. I'm just gonna go to Finland. Are you aware of a CIA psychological profile about you, sir? Would you be interested in hearing what the CIA had to say? This secret study portrays as a brilliant but dangerous megalomaniac who is likely to pursue his own aims in disregard of U.S. interests. He's an uncertain ally. Shall I go on or would you prefer that I stop, sir? 